Happy Sabbath, and thanks for joining us for another service with Discover Life Seventh-day Adventist Church, where our mission is to know God, grow together, and do good. It's the Christmas season, and during the Christmas season, we like to place a special emphasis on how it is more blessed to give than to receive. However, I'm here to give you another thought today. You see, there is one gift that we receive that we should focus on above all of the other gifts that we can possibly give, and that is the gift of Jesus Christ. Regardless of the season, regardless of the time of year, I pray that each and every one of you are found during this holiday season thinking about the ultimate gift that was given to you, the best gift that could ever be given, the gift of God's grace and his forgiveness through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which makes it possible for us to have the hope of eternity. Simply as a formality, I'll remind you that if you do have a gift to give that's a monetary donation, you can do so by going to discoverlifesonora.org and click on the Give button. But let's close out today's announcements by saying that on behalf of our staff and media team, we are grateful for each and every one of you, grateful that you've joined us, grateful that we get to share in the hope of eternal life with each of you. May God be gracious unto you, may he give you peace, and may you be blessed by today's worship experience. Merry Christmas, and God bless to each and every one of you.
Welcome to the Discover Life online experience. I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Sabbath. As we're about to jump into God's Word, I'd like to invite you to pray with me. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for not leaving us in the dark about who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself in all of your beauty in Christ. Father, today we ask that as we turn toward your word, that you would teach us and that you would grow us. Father, you know all of the pain and heartache that's in our world, and we ask for healing and wholeness and strength and encouragement to continue to make it through. God, as we open your word, may you teach us, may you bless us, and may we draw close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before I became a believer in Jesus, one of my objections to Christianity was that I perceived God as fundamentally unfair in the way that he treated humanity. This objection did not come from reading scripture. It did not come from really understanding who God in scripture claims to be. It was informed by my interactions with Christians. And many of those Christians assumed that anybody who didn't see the world exactly like them was going to burn in hell for eternity. They would say that God loves the world, but their understanding of God and the understanding of God they conveyed made God look cruel. It made God look like a tyrant who was playing games with the destiny of humanity. It was as if the way they saw the world was that if you were a Christian, which meant that you had prayed some simple prayer, no matter your character, uh, you were safe and secure and could never be condemned. If you were not a Christian, no matter your character, you were utterly hopeless. And the sad reality was is that the main influence as to whether or not you were a Christian or not was things that were completely out of your control, things like where you were born, your nationality, your culture. Hindus didn't choose to be born Hindus, and secularists didn't choose to be born secularists, and Buddhists didn't choose to be born Buddhist. And, and this, this arbitrary where you were born, what your nation was, what your religion based on your nation was, determined your destiny. This, to me, made God like a tribal God. It made your it made God like he was playing a game and it's like, oh, you were born in America. You were raised Christian. You're going to heaven. Oh, you were born in Calcutta. You were not raised Christian. Therefore, you are going to die and burn in hell. This was the story that I understood that Christians were telling. The reality is that God is not a tribal God. The God of the Bible is, in fact, the God of the whole world. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me. God is not the tribal God of Christianity. He is, in fact, the God of all humanity. And the God of all humanity is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that word repentance, it sounds like a religious word, but it literally just means make a U-turn. You're walking the wrong direction and you make a U-turn. My friend, God is the God of all mankind. God is not slow. Indeed, he is very patient with us. He wants every human being to make a U-turn. He does not want 
anyone to perish. And so as I began to understand the reality, as I began to understand the truth, and the truth is not that God is our little provincial tribal God who loves us, uh, that rather he is the God of the whole world and that he loves the whole world, I began to warm, my heart began to warm to the truth that there is a good and beautiful God who loves the whole world, who is working to lead the whole world to make a U-turn. There's a time in the Old Testament where uh, Joshua, Joshua was leading the Israelites into the land of Cana. And Israel, as they entered the land of Cana, were at war with the people of that land. And the Israelites believed that God was on their side, that God was for Israel and against the Canaanites. And Joshua has an encounter with a man, and in most translations that word man is capitalized because this is a supernatural man. This is, this is, this is God in human flesh. And Joshua asks this, this theophany, this, this God in human flesh, Joshua went to him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? And I want you to notice God's reply. God's reply is, Neither, he replied, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. I want you to notice God is not the tribal God. God is the God of all flesh. He wants all people to make a U-turn. Everybody that's walking the wrong path, he wants them all to make a U-turn. When, when, when God's people were in a national war against another nation, they asked God, whose team are you on? Are you on our side or their side? And God's answer was... Neither. God is not a tribal God who is looking to keep some people out and other people in. He is the God of the whole world who is working on every single person in every single place to lead them to make a U-turn. We see a similar thing with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was in a place called the Areopagus. And this was a place where the intellectual elite met and had discussions and conversations. And Paul is there engaging with these um, intellectuals, these philosophers. And I want you to notice what Paul says. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives, notice this word, everyone, life and breath and everything else. God is not a provincial God. He's not a tribal God. He's not a partisan God. Paul is speaking to uh, religious, uh, oh, excuse me, he's speaking to philosophers who have nothing to do with his God. And Paul says, God is the one that gives everyone everything. He then goes on, from one man... He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God is the one that organized people in different places and in different cultures, and God did this, according to Paul, so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from every one of us. The idea that we read here in the words of the Apostle Paul is that God is near to all humanity and that we are like, like uh, children groping in the darkness, but God is right there, near to everyone. And that's something that we see in the Christian, in the Christmas story. In the Christmas story, we see these, these, these giant signs that essentially say, 
God is on your side. God is here for you. God is for not just a few people, but actually God is for all humanity. In fact, it says, uh, when the angels show up at the time of the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. God is pouring out his favor and his good will toward all humanity in the coming of Jesus. If you have ever wrestled, if you have ever wondered, if you have ever struggled about how God feels about you, the story of the coming of Jesus, the story of the shepherds who heard the angels speak, they heard the angels affirm that in the coming of Jesus, God is bringing peace and he is bringing good will toward humanity. Maybe in no other place do we see the fact that God is at work for all people than in the story of the wise men who came later to see Jesus. We'll pick that story up in Matthew chapter 2. In Matthew chapter 2, the Bible says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Maybe we need to just stop here for a moment. It says, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Now, that little phrase, wise men from the east, should, should alert us that these are not good Jews who were following the one true God. The, the people of the East were considered bad. They were considered heathen. They were considered pagans. They were considered people who worshipped false gods. And wise men were, were, were worse than the regular uh, bad people from the East. The wise men tended to look to the stars and try to understand what was happening on this world uh, on the basis of the stars, that many of the wise men, we would consider something like astrologers. Many of the wise men of the East were mathematicians, but they weren't mathematicians like we have today. They were mathematicians, but math was almost like a magical spiritual force that... that um, that had like religious significance. And so when the Bible says wise men from the East came, in, in the Jewish culture, the, the thought would be there is something wrong with these guys. And the thing wrong with these guys is that they're dangerous. They're bad. And they're dangerous and bad because... They're dangerous and bad because they don't follow the one true God. They're involved in, in, in astrology. They have this magical conception of numbers, and there's just all kinds of things wrong. And certainly, many of the wise men from the East were um, deceivers of their own people and charlatans, but other wise men from the East were studying the works of nature, seeking to discern the hand and the guidance of God. And that's the kind of men these wise men were. They had come to Jerusalem to worship the Messiah, the King of the Jews, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and when he gathered all the chief uh, priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler whose she who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, it's fascinating because these wise men did not know this prediction found in the book of Micah. Um, but Herod, uh, and Herod didn't know it either, but, um, 
But what we will see is that it's likely, very likely, that the wise men did have some idea of Scripture. When Herod, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Now, to me, this is an absolutely fascinating point. The wise men came to visit, came seeking the Messiah because they saw a star. And to me, this is beautiful. These astrologers, which is what the wise men were, these astrologers from the pagan land were studying the stars, and how did God communicate to them about the coming of the Messiah? He communicated to them about the coming of the Messiah in the language they understood. God sent the astrologers a star. This tells me that even if you have a wrong conception, right? Like, like I don't believe in astrology. You shouldn't, you shouldn't read uh, about astrology. You shouldn't study astrology from my understanding of Scripture. It's spiritualism. It's dangerous. It's not a good thing. But God chose to speak to these wise men who were studying the stars in the language that they understood. He sent them a star to guide them to the Messiah. And what we learn from this, my friends, is so beautiful. It's not like it's not like there's a little Christian club that God loves and everybody else God hates and isn't interested in. No, God is at work in the whole world. He He's at work among the wise men. He's at work among the astrologers. He's at work among those that that we might think are cast off. Certainly, in the days of Jesus, the community would have thought those wise men were cast off. But in fact, they were closer to the Messiah, closer to finding the Messiah, than the very religious leaders themselves. Now, it's interesting because Herod called the wise men and determined from them what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till they till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come to his into the house, now I want you to notice a couple of things here. They come to the house. Now, if you read the birth narrative in Luke, you notice that Jesus is not in a house. He's actually in a manger, which would have been kept where the animals were fed. Jesus, in the book of Matthew, is traveling to Bethlehem. Uh, Jesus' parents are traveling to Bethlehem, and the shepherds are there, and Jesus is born. Now, the story of the wise men, the magi, happens later, much later, in fact, than the story of the shepherds. Because here, Jesus is no longer in a manger. Jesus and his family have now a house that they're dwelling in, in Bethlehem. These magi, these wise men, fall down and worship Jesus, and then they opened their treasures and presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country uh, another way. Now, what's amazing to me, and we we know this because if we keep reading in the book of Matthew, um, Herod seeks to kill all of the children born that are under the age of two years old. And so the wise men came sometime after the birth of Jesus, sometime after the shepherds had come. The magi, the wise men, would have had some some experience with Scripture, maybe from Daniel, who lived in the East, maybe from uh, Balaam. In fact, Balaam had predicted in the Old Testament book of Numbers. He says, I see him. He's, he's prophesying of the Messiah. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. 
A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. What we see here in the book of Numbers is this prediction that someday a star is going to rise in Israel. And that star in the sky indicated that the real star, the Messiah, was coming into his role as the rightful king of this earth. These magi, these wise men understood that the Messiah was coming. They came and worshiped him. They came and gave gifts to him and celebrated him when all the religious leaders, all of the political leaders, everybody else was in total ignorance. Here's the bottom line, my friend. It's easy to think that Christianity is some sort of tribal uh, God and that there are people that are that are in and they're in in a way they can never be out and there are people outside that are outside in a way they can never be inside and the story of the wise men from the east tells me that people who have a lot of things very wrong can be very very close to God and some people who have a lot of things right can be very, very far from God. In other words, my friends, I want you to know this. The story of Jesus is the story that God is the God of the whole earth. That's what we learn from the Magi. And this God is working in every single heart and mind throughout the whole world. He is drawing close to every single person that they might feel for him, they might grope for him, that they might find him. And the wise men found him. And there is a bottom line message for us today, and that is that the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, that little babe born in Bethlehem in a manger, there is a bottom line message, and that is Glory to God in the highest, praise to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. That's God's disposition toward humanity. That's God's disposition toward you, good will toward men goodwill toward humanity. God is for us, not against us. And he is at work in your life. He's at work in my life. He's at work in every single human being's life on this planet of more than 7 billion. And his message is, come, come to me and be welcomed. And so my friend today, God has completely and totally revealed who he is in Jesus Christ. God is good. God is welcoming. God is, is winning even people that would traditionally be perceived as far from God. And sometimes even the people that we would think are close need to get a little closer. And so this Christmas season, my friend, I want you to just remember and to soak in, to soak in this beautiful promise that in the coming of Christ, we see that God has good will toward all humanity. Let me pray with you. Father, may we remember in our dark moments that the coming of Jesus sends a bottom line message that you have good will toward humanity. Father, we embrace you. We embrace the message of Jesus. We embrace that you treat us with good will. Father, when we're walking down the wrong path, may we turn around and turn toward you. May you do that in our lives. And bless us this Christmas season, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.